We are live. Welcome to SQL Friday number 58 with uh, Andrew Pruski today, who is going to talk about Docker. And I don't always introduce people as experts to a certain topic, but in this case, I'm, I'm pretty confident to say that we have a real Docker expert in the house today. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Great to be here. So, Andrew works from uh, Ireland. Uh, if I'm going to try to do an intro, um, I think Andrew would do it better. I'm just going to say Andrew is the guy who, who does Docker like a pro and locks himself into cupboards. <laughs> that joke is going to follow me around for the rest of my career. I think so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the stage is all yours. Just take over when you're ready. Okay, I'll grab the screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? I see your screen, yes. What I'll do is I'll move this as well. There we go. Okay. So welcome everyone to this session, a deep dive into Docker. My name is Andrew Prusky. I'm a SQL Server DBA, Microsoft Data Platform MVP, and certified Kubernetes administrator. I'm originally from Swansea, Wales, but have been living in Dublin Island for, it's coming on eight years now. My Twitter handle and my email address are on the screen there at DBA from the cold and DBA from the cold at gmail.com. So if you have any questions after today, please feel free to reach out. I'm always willing to talk about this stuff. My blog's there as well, DBA from the cold.com, posted multiple articles about running SQL Server in containers, some of which I'm basing this session on, some of which go into even further deep dive. But if you want to check that out, you are more than welcome. And then finally there at the bottom is my GitHub account. All the slides and the code for this session are on my GitHub account, and I'll post a link to all the resources at the end. So that is it for the slides. I don't want to do any more slides. I want to actually dive into the Docker platform. So I'm going to switch over to VS Code. Can you all see my screen there? Is that big enough? Everyone's OK? Looks perfect to me, at least. Great. OK. So we're going to talk about five different topics in Docker. We're going to talk about container isolation, container networking, persisting data. Fourth one is a building custom images out of mind freezer. And then we're going to have a look at Docker Compose. But the first one is container isolation. How is container isolation actually achieved? We've all heard the uh, uh, Docker saying, ah, containers are an isolated environment that contain all the necessary binaries and libraries required by a piece of software to run in the same manner, regardless of its environment. But kind of glosses over the isolation bit there. How is that isolation achieved? And it is achieved through three main Linux constructs. So we're talking things called control groups, namespaces, and changing the root of the container. And through those three constructs, container isolation is achieved because containers aren't actually a thing. There's no actual, this is a container that you can point out on a, on a host. They are, isolation is achieved through those three constructs. And that means a process running on the host is isolated from its environment. And that's all a container is, is a container, is a process running on say a Linux host in a control group, namespace, and its root is changed. And that is, so let's have a look at that. So on my Docker host here, Let's run a container. And we're going to start off with the usual Docker container run dash D, run it in the background, demonize it so I can continue using this shell. We're going to publish some ports. And all this is saying is map port 15789 on the host to 1433 within the container. So that means anything hitting the host on 15789 gets mapped into 1433 in the container, and we can connect to our SQL instance. Here, I'm going to limit the memory of this container to two gigs, just using the dash dash memory flag. Then standard environment variables, I'm going to accept the end user license agreement for SQL, which you have to do every time you run a container, and set the SA password so we can connect in. I'm going to give the container a name, SQL container one, and then I'm going to run it from an image. And this image is just the 2019 CU5 Ubuntu 18.4 image. So let's run that container. There we go, I get, a, I get a warning about swap capabilities. So that's just because of the host I'm running on. We're not gonna worry about that. We're gonna confirm that container is running. Uh, 
that output is actually terrible. So what I'm going to use is the dash dash format flag and limit my output, make it a little bit nicer. Pretty much impractical, but it's great for presenting. And I can see that my container has a status of up. I am good to go. So if we grab that container ID, there we go. I can now have a look at the control groups that have been created. And there's a whole bunch of them. Now, what a control group is, it pretty much does exactly what it says on the tin. A control group controls the resources of the host that the container is allowed to use. So when I use that dash dash memory flag and limited to two gig, what's happening in the background is that a memory control group has been created, and that is what actually limits SQL to two, that SQL container to using two gig on the host. And I can dive in and I can have a look. What we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the memory control group, and we're going to have a look at the CPU control group. So I'm just going to grab those locations. And I can grab the memory limit. It's in bytes, so I'm going to divide it by 1024 a couple of times. And there we can see the memory limit. So that memory of the container is limited by that control group being created in the background. Let's have a look at the CPU one. CPU is set to minus one. That's because I didn't limit the CPU resources of the host to that container. So it's unlimited, and that's what minus one means. Just that this container, if it wants to, can use all the resource, the CPU resources of the host. So let's change that. Let's use Docker update SQL container one and limit it to CPUs two. And I'm saying thanks, Anthony, it's in the script there, because I always thought this is a while ago now, but I still say thank you to Anthony for telling me. Anthony Yosentino, loads of Pluralsight courses, go and check them out. Loads of Kubernetes stuff if you're into that. It's absolutely fantastic stuff. But I always thought you had to stop a container, update it, and then spin it back up. But you can actually limit the CPU on the fly. And now if we have a look at that CPU limit again, it's 200,000, but that basically assumes, they're basically saying that it is limited to two CPUs on my host. So those are control groups being created in the background that control the resources that the container can use of the host. And this limits, uh, this prevents, say, the noisy neighbor pro problem, where, say, you have a load of containers running on a host, and one container takes all the resources of the host, starves the other ones, and they're all their performance is affected. So if you're running multiple containers on a host, I would always recommend using the CPU and memory flags. OK. So let's move on to namespaces. Let's have a look at the namespaces that were created for that container. And there's a few of them. Now, if control groups control what a container can use, namespaces control what a container can see. So by dropping this container to certain namespaces, we control what it can see on the host. And there's a whole bunch of them, mount, UTS, IPC, PID, and net. Uh, mount, we don't want the container to see the same mount as the host, so it's in a different mount namespace. UTS stands for Unix Time Sharing System namespace. Now, it sounds scary and complicated, but pretty much all it does is allow the container to have a different host name than the host. Then we have inter-process communication namespace. Uh, processes in Linux can share the same memory, uh, shared memory. We typically don't want containers to see memory of the other processes running, so it's in its own IPC namespace. PID namespace, process ID namespace. The container can only see its own processes. It can't see all the processes running on the host. We'll have a look at that again. And network as well, separate network stack. OK, right. Let's dive a little bit further into some of these namespaces. Let's have a look at the UTS namespace. There we go. Host name of my host that I'm running on is called Docker. I'm pretty unimaginative, so I'm running Docker on this Linux box up in Azure. It's called Docker. Why not? But let's have a look at the host name within the container. So I'm going to run a command against the container. I'm going to use Docker exec container name and then the command I want to run. And we'll be doing this quite a bit. So Docker exec container name and the command I want to run. This time, I'm going to run host name. There we go. The container has a different host name than the host that it's running on. And that's because it is in a UTS namespace, which allows that to happen. OK. Let's have a look at the processes running in that container. So I'm going to run docker exec uh, container name and then ps orc. Just run, show me the processes that are running. And we have our two. SQL Server processes and my own command. Container only sees its own processes. It can't see all the processes running on the host because it is in a 
PID namespace. If I look at the processes on the host here, just run it there, we can see those are the processes of the container. The container is just processes running on a host in control groups and namespaces and have the root change. We'll have a look at changing the root in a bit, but that's all it is. We can see they have a different process ID than the actual runs running in the container because it's in a different in a process ID namespace. One thing to note here, in the container it's running as the MS SQL user. That user does not exist on the host. And that's why we get the user ID and not the name. Now there is something called the user namespace, which allows for different user, uh, users, sorry, users in the container to be mapped to different users on the host. By default, Docker doesn't do this. And we'll have a look at why that can be an issue now. So if I grab the PID, I can jump into the namespace as well, so using sudo nsenter. And now I can run things like hostname and check the process is running. I'm basically in the container because I've jumped into those namespaces and I'm having a look around. But let's have a look at that process ID namespace a little bit more and the user namespace and why it could possibly be an issue. So what I'm going to do here is run another container, and I'm just going to run it as a, I'm going to run it from a custom image. And all this image is is running SQL as root instead of that MS SQL user here. So by default in 2019, SQL runs as the MS SQL user. They changed this, I think, either at the end of the 2017 images or at the start of the 2019 images. I can't quite remember. But SQL used to run as root in containers. And let's have a look why that could be an issue. There we go. We have all of our processes here. This is our original container run as the MS SQL user. Here, we have our new container. And in that container, SQL is running as root. Because it's not implemented the user namespace, that process is actually running as root on my host. And that could possibly give that container a little bit more access to the host than I want it to. So this is one of the reasons Microsoft switched from running SQL as root in a container to run in SQL as a custom user, the MS SQL user. And that's one of the reasons for that change. OK, so that's control groups, controlling what the container can use. And then namespaces, controlling what the container can see. The third construct is changing the root of the container. So let's create a database. I'm just going to connect to my original container Using the MS SQL CLI, if you've never checked it out, it's like SQL command on steroids. It does some really cool things like IntelliSense and stuff like that. Very much recommend you check it out. OK, we've created our database. Now let's have a look at those database files. By default, they'll be in var opt MS SQL data, the default location for all the databases in a SQL container. And we've got all our system databases in there. And there is our master data, uh, test database, sorry, master databases up here. OK. So that's the location. If you have a look at those, that location on the host, I'm just listing them out. That location doesn't exist. The container thinks all of its database files are in this location, but that's not the location where they are on the host. I can actually use Docker inspect and echo that out, and we can have a look. This is where they actually are on the host. They're in this merge directory. This is like a unified view. I'm not going to go into the union file system, but this is a unified view of all the files of the container. That's where they're living on the host. And so now, if I do this, I can list them out. We've got the root location here. And now, I do this. There we go. So the container thinks they're in var opt MS SQL data, whereas in reality, on the host, they're in this file location and then that path. This is because when the container starts up, its root is changed to this location on the host. Uh, sorry, to this location. This limits what the container can see. The container can't see anything above this location here, above its root. So we're limiting the file system of the host to a small subset that the container can use. So it can't go outside that location. So this is further isolating that container. OK, so let's clean up a little bit here. So we've got control groups, namespaces, and changing the root. If we know those three concepts, can we build a container from scratch? not using Docker at all. Say we want to build it in Go. Now, I am not a Go programmer in any way, shape, or form. 
So this is fairly ropey, and I do not recommend you use this for anything other than messing about with. But let's have a look. So first thing, we're going to run a container. Just run a container again. Get that up and running. What we want that to do is basically unpack all its layers into one file system that we can grab. So let's grab that file system. Let's make sure that container is running. There it is. OK, it's up about nine seconds. It should be fine. Let's make sure SQL is running using Docker logs. Yeah, that looks pretty good. If anyone's familiar with SQL Server here, that very much looks like the SQL error log. We can grab the SQL error log by using Docker logs container name. Right, let's stop that container. It's spun up, it's extracted its file system. Let's see if I can now export it to this .tar file. Now, I'm not going to do that. It takes a bit of time, but I already have it here. We've exported our container, and now what I can do is extract it into a directory here. And let's list the contents of that. There we go. Now, a whole bunch of files here, and I've dropped a text file in here just to say, say hi, DB from the call, to prove that when we spin this container up, this is where the root will be changed to. So already created that. We can start the container again if we want to. And we can have a look at its root directory. Pretty much the same bin boot dev x, yep. There we go. So what we did was basically extracted this file system into our SQL Server directory here. And this is where we're going to run our container from. So we don't need it anymore. Let's get rid of that. And we've already grabbed everything we need from it. And let's go to some code. So we have a whole bunch of code here. It's Go. Let's have a quick look at it. I'm not a Go programmer, but we'll just go through a little bit of it. Here. So we're doing a whole bunch of stuff in here. Um, what I want to draw attention to is this part here. This is where we're creating, say, our UTS namespace, PID namespace. Uh, <laughs> I've had a mind freeze. I can't remember what that one does. Ne um, network namespace, maybe. Mm. It's been a while since I wrote this. And I'm, again, I'm not a Go programmer. But this is where we're creating our namespaces. And if we come down here, come further down, we are setting the host name of our container. We're going to call it container. Again, I'm really unimaginative. And then. We are going to change the root of our container to where we extracted our previous container's file system. So here we go, home DBA from the policy server. And then finally, we're going to create some control groups. We are going to set memory limit to 2 gig, and we're going to set the CPU to 2. And then we do a whole bunch of other stuff here. OK, so we've got a bit of Go code here that's going to Create some namespaces, change the root, create some control groups. So let's have a look at that. OK, this is where it goes horribly wrong when I'm using two uh, mucks in a demo. And let's see how it goes. Oh, yes. One thing I did want to mention is if you want to see someone much more skilled in running containers from scratch using Go, please go and check out Liz Rice's containers from scratch code. It's basically what I've got there. I've made it a little few tweaks to get SQL up and running. But if you want to check out how to run SQL containers uh, containers from scratch using Go, go and have a look at that YouTube video. It's absolutely fantastic. And I'll post a link to that at the end. Right. Let's see if I can remember my. Uh... Nope. <laughs> Every time. There we go. Right. OK, so I'm going to run my code. There it is. Hopefully, boom. There we go. And we are in our container. You can check the root directory. Hey, container's root has been changed to that file system we extracted from our previous container. And we've got our high DB from the cold text file there. You can test the host name as well. There we go. We can see it here. But container host name has been changed to container. Kind of cool. Now, to get SQL working, we have to create this new random file. Um, I'm saying thanks, Mark. There, uh, It's a colleague of mine called Mark Wilkinson actually worked this out. SQL needs this new random file to be created beforehand using MKNOD. Um, I literally, he gave me that code. I ran it, and I got SQL up and running. Please, I'm going to hold my hands up here and go, not 100% sure what that statement does. It just creates a new random file that SQL needs so SQL can spin up. And there it is. OK, there, great. All righty. 
So now what we can do is spin up SQL. I'm, there's the location of the SQL Server binary, and I'm just going to pipe all of the output to it to dev null so that I can not have all the output coming. If I did this, the whole uh, SQL would spin up at, at standard out, and I wouldn't be able to use this terminal anymore. I don't want that to happen. Okie dokie. So SQL is up and running in our container built from scratch, maybe? Let's have a look. Oh, there it is. Hey, cool. And then if I come down to the other one, uh, this is what happened before. Yep, there we go. Right, come here. Ah, here we go, right. OK, so now we have SQL running in our container in this terminal here, and I can check the processes running on the host here. There we go. We have our two SQL Server processes running in our container from scratch, running as the root user because I'm running as root. But we can do stuff like, let's have a look at the control groups that were created. I'm running out of screen space a little bit here, but no worries. We have a whole bunch of control groups that are created. I can get the memory limit, divide it again like we did before. And there's our two gig memory limit, and there is our two CPU limit. So, because we know the constructs behind how containers work on Linux, we can actually spin up a container from scratch just using, I don't know, how many lines of code is that? Let's have a look at it. 80 lines of code, oh, and we've got a container up and running. Now, OK, there are certain things missing, say, networking and things like that. But you know, fairly simple to get a container up and running. OK, so that is container isolation and how you can replicate it using a little bit of Go code. OK, um, if everyone's still with me, let's move on. Let's talk about something else. Let's go for, let's do container networking. Why not? Let's come back here. Let's just make sure I haven't got anything running on this host now. Uh, PS or rep and then SQL. Oh, just me. Okay, great. Okie dokie. Let's have a look at some container networking. If you list the networks on a Docker host, you will see three by default. You will see host, bridge, and none. Now, host basically means you remove the isolation between the container networking stack and the host networking stack. You're using the host networking stack when you spin up a container. None means disable networking. You will spin a container up, you won't be able to connect to it. The only way you're going to get into it is by Docker exec. You can jump in, run a load of stuff, and then when you're finished, blow your container away. Really useful if you want to run like a hyper isolated environment. Just jump in, run a load of programming, do whatever you want, and then jump out of it, blow your container away. The one I want to talk about is the bridge network. This is the default. If you run a container without specifying a network, this is the network that you are going to run your container on. And it is represented by the Docker Zero network here. That is your default bridge network. So let's have a look at it. Let's do Docker network inspect and bridge. We've got a whole bunch of stuff. We've got our subnet, our gateway, but here we have containers. No containers running on my host at the moment. So there's nothing in there. Let's run a couple of SQL containers on the default bridge network. Now, I'm running again uh, here from a custom image. All this is doing, it's got things like ping installed. It's basically SQL Server from the Microsoft image, but I've installed a couple of tools. Um, these, if you want to grab these, they are on my GitHub account, and they are. Um, I'll post a link to that at the end, and you can pull them down. But literally, is just SQL with things like ping. So let's grab that. One thing to note with these two containers, I'm not actually running any dash dash publish or dash p flags. So I'm not mapping any ports in the host to the ports in the container. And we'll have a look at that. Let's make sure those are running first. There we go. Two containers up and running about 14 seconds. Great. OK, so let's clear that. And let's have a look at that default bridge network again. Tell you what, bring this up a little bit. Uh, maybe too much. There we go. OK. So now I have two containers running, and I have their IP addresses. So I can grab that by running these commands. Whoop, come down. There we go. And here. Okie dokie. So we have two containers up and running. They have two IP addresses. 
What I'm going to try now is to ping container two from container one using its name. It doesn't work. The default bridge network that Docker provides doesn't allow for names to be mapped to IP addresses. There's no DNS resolution. So containers, by default, when we spin them up, can't talk to each other using the container name. But they can talk to each other using the IP address. So we can grab the IP address of any containers on the bridge network and get them talking to each other using their private IP addresses. And I can connect to SQL exactly the same way. Using that IP address, I can run a very simple command using select at app version, and there we go. Microsoft SQL Server 2019 CU5. So if we spin up containers and we don't map any ports on the default bridge network, they can still talk to each other. We can still connect. We just have to use their IP addresses instead of saying like localhost and the port that we've mapped. So let's have a look a little bit. Let's blow that away. OK, now there's a little trick we can do here. If we want to get containers talking to each other on the default bridge network, we can actually use this little flag, add host. So we can add a host into its into the container's host file and map a container name to IP address. Now it's not great. I mean, we have to work, we have to basically know what IP address the container is going to get before we do this. But as I'm only running two containers on this host, I'm pretty guaranteed they're going to get those IP addresses. And I can spin them up. And now, because I've added entries into the host name file, those containers can now talk to each other using the container name. I don't have to grab the IP address. OK, but when we connect to containers, I think everyone here who's run a Docker container will have used dash p or dash dash publish. And what exactly what we did in the first demo was we're going to map some ports on the host to ports in the container. And I, this one, I like using 15789. I'm getting these out of thin air, by the way. I am not. Um, there's no rhyme or reason why I'm using that number. I just need a port on the host that's not going to be in use. And that has served me well so far. So there's no actual reason for this number. You can put anything you want, but just make sure the port's not in use. So let's run those two up. There we go. And now we can have a look using Docker port. And we can see the port mapping. So here we have port 1433 in the container to 15789 on the host and port 1433 in the second container to 15799 on the host. And that means we can do like pretty much everyone has seen before. If we're running on the host, we can use localhost and the port number and just connect into SQL. And there we go. Okie dokie. Right, so that is the default bridge network that Docker provides for us. But we can create our own networks. And Docker provides some drivers for this. We have the three that we've uh, already mentioned, host, null, and bridge. We also have Mac VLAN. You can assign a Mac address to your container so it appears as a physical device on the network. I've never actually done that, but hey, it's there for you. And there's overlay as well, which is used in Docker Swarm to get multiple Docker demons talking to each other. But if we just create a network, if we say Docker network create and don't specify a driver, what it's going to do for us is create a user defined bridge network. And user defined bridge networks have one major advantage over the default bridge network that Docker provides. And that is that it allows DNS resolution for container name to IP address. We don't have to muck around with anything, it'll do it by default. So let's run two containers on our new custom network by using dash dash network equals SQL Server. So I'm going to grab all this. And our two containers, there we go. And now, without doing anything to the host file or anything like that, I can ping one container from the other using the container name. I don't have to muck about because Docker has a built-in DNS server. We can see it by running cat exe exolve against our container, and there is its IP address. That is the IP address of Docker's internal DNS server. So by using a user-defined bridge network, we can get containers talking to each other by using their container name. You don't have to muck about with anything, which is really handy for if you're building a situation where you want containers talking to each other. Uh, one recent example I did, I was testing 
uh, replication settings, and I needed uh, like a publisher, distributor, and a subscriber. Spun up all the containers on a custom bridge network, and they could all talk to each other just by using the container name because I was using a user-defined bridge network. Okay, let's do a little bit of cleanup here and get rid of our network as well. We don't need. There we go. Great. Okay, so we've covered isolation and we've covered networking. Let's probably have a look at another topic now, which is probably the most important for our SQL Server folks, persisting our data. How do we persist data from one container to another? Now, there's three different methods that you can use to do this. I'm only going to talk about two of them because the first one I don't like. And that first one is something called bind mounts or mounting volumes from the host. And I don't like this because it puts an external dependency of the container on the host. If you move your container to a different host and that location is not there, you're going to have issues. So I don't particularly like it. Um, and you can run into things, problems with uh, what sort of permissions on the host and stuff like that. Not a big fan. Um, one method, one way of using it is if you want to mount a really large database into a container, you can have the database files or the backup file on your host, mount it in, restore it, attach it, whatever. But I would say if you're going to be running large databases, maybe containers aren't the um, best choice for it, but hey. But there are other two methods of, of persisting our data. There is something called named volumes and data volume containers. Named volumes are the one I want to have a look at first. Named volumes are literally just volumes that we create within Docker by saying Docker volume create, and we give it a name. So we can verify our volumes there. Docker volume, drivers local, volume name SQL Server. Great. So I have a name volume there. What I can do now is spin up a container with that name volume mapped. And what I'm going to do here is map that volume, SQL Server, to var ops SQL Server in the container. So I'm going to be creating this location in our container. So let's spin that up. Make sure that container is running. Up three seconds. Give it, a, give it, say, 10 seconds. Just make sure SQL's up. Three more seconds. There we go. OK. And now what I'm going to do is use MS SQL CLI to connect into my container. Uh, I published port 15999, so localhost 15999. And we're going to create a database on that location. Here we go. Aha. OK. We had an error. The reason we've had that error is because SQL now in 2019 runs under a custom user, the MS SQL user. It doesn't run as root. So SQL, the user does not have access to that location. So let's have a look at it in the container, Docker exec var opt, and there's our SQL server. And we can see here only the root user has access. So what I'm going to do is change the owner of that location to the MS SQL user. Look at that again. There we go. MS SQL now has access. And I can by creating my database again. Fingers crossed. Let's see if this works. Excellent. Now, because SQL has access, our command run ran. Okie dokie. So we've created a custom database on a, in a location in a container that's supported by a name volume. Let's make sure that database is actually there. Why not? There it is, test database, fantastic stuff. Right, so we create our database. Let's blow that container away. No mucking around. Confirm that that container is gone. So I'm proving that I'm not cheating here. And there's no containers running on my host. But I still have my name volume. So what I can do now is run another container and remap that volume. So spin that up. Make sure it's running. Give it 10 seconds. Make sure SQL's come up. Come on, three more. Oh, that'll do. At this point, I don't need to change it. Sorry, at this point, the container's up. Our volume's mapped. Uh, let's have a look at the permissions. The permissions have persisted as well. MS SQL still has access to my database files. So now I can recreate my database by using the create database for attach statement and just go, oh, hello. There we go. 
fingers crossed. There we go. Command complete success. And I can confirm my database as well. Hey, there it is. Great. So by using a name volume, we have persisted a database from one container to another. We spun a container up, created a database. We could pump a load of data into whatever we want. When we're finished, blow a container away. And then when we want to come back and do some more work, we can spin a container up, get our database back, and we've got all our data there. All our work is ready to go. But no, it's a bit manual, really. Do I really want to have to be running a create database statement each time? Let's have a look at doing it automatically. Wouldn't it be nice if we could spin a container up and our database was ready to go? So let's go and create two new name volumes. I'm going to call it MS SQL system and MS SQL user. There's my two volumes. So now what I'm going to do is create, let's bring this down a little bit, a new container, and I'm going to map my two volumes. The MS SQL user is going to be in the same location as before of our Ops SQL server. What I'm doing here for the MS SQL system is mounting at var opt MS SQL. Now, var opt MS SQL contains a data directory, and in that data directory, there is the master database. So, what we're going to do here is spin up a container and persist the master database location and the user database location. Now, if we do that and, map, and as we'll see in a second, blow this container away and remap to another container will have persisted our master database, which will have an entry for our user database, same as normal SQL Server. So when the container spins up, again, it'll look in the master database, go, hey, I've got a database here. And our database will automatically be online for us in our new SQL instance, in our new container. But let's see that in action. Um, so we map in the volumes, end user license agreement, and I'm specifying the default data directory and log directory to var opt SQL Server. Let's go. Okie dokie. Make sure that's up. Come on. We'll give it about a few more seconds just to make sure I'm not doing it quickly. Cool, cool. 10 seconds. Great. Still need to change the owner to MS SQL. And now I can create a database. This time I'm going to say create database test database two. Don't need to specify the file locations because I set the default data and log directories using these environment variables. And that's completed successfully. Let's confirm our database is there. We are database, yes. And we can confirm the file locations as well. And there we go. Both files are on var op SQL Server, which is backed by our named volume. We have a look at them on the host as well. They are in the container as well by running LSVR. So there they are. They're in the container. SQL is access. We're all good. Right. What I meant. There we go. Let's blow that container away. Same as before. Getting rid of it. Confirming. Yep. No containers running. But we still have our name volumes. So what I can do. Spin up another container, remapping, mapping where our user database was, test database two, and mapping the location where the master database is. Let's confirm that's running. Stay at 10 seconds, and let's see if our database is there. Fingers crossed. Boom. There it is. So by persisting where the master database is and our user database is, Create a database, blow that container away, and then spin up a new container with those name volumes now mapped. We can have our user databases ready to go and persisted from one container to another without having to run any messy like create database for attached scripts. Cool. OK. So that is how to persist your data from one container to another using name volumes. And this is the method I would recommend. Always use name volumes. They're fantastic. Bind mounts. Uh, uh, but I do want to briefly mention another method, which is called data volume containers. What we're going to do here is we're going to spin up a container. We're not going to run it. We're just going to create it. So we're going to say Docker container create. We're going to give it a name and we call it data store. 
Then we're going to create a load of volumes. We're going to create var opt MS SQL data where the system databases live. Oh, don't do that, Andrew. Var opt SQL server data, var opt SQL server log, var opt SQL server backups. And I'm going to run it from a custom Ubuntu image. Now, the reason I'm running a custom Ubuntu image is because I need to set permissions for these file locations. But we're going to talk about custom images in just a second. But for now, all this is is a Ubuntu image, a Ubuntu container with these locations with access granted for SQL Server. Let's spin that up. There we go. We won't have a look at the Docker file. We'll have a look at Docker files in a little bit. There we go. We have our data store, data volume container created. Notice it's not running. It's just created. It's not up. It's just sitting there. And what's happened in the background here is it's created four name volumes for us. So now I can create a SQL container. And instead of specifying dash dash volume for data, dash dash volume for log, dash dash volume for system, dash dash volume for backups, I can just say volumes from my data volume container. Spin this up. Let's have a look. Time, loads of time. Good. OK, and there's our container up and running. Give it a few more seconds. There we go. And now, they create a database. So exactly the same before. We've got a container with a load of name volumes from our data volume container. We create a database. Confirm our database is there. Hey, there we go. And let's have a look at those files. There we go, var op SQL Server data, var op SQL Server log. All righty. Let's blow that container away. No messing around. Get rid. Bye bye. Confirm that it's gone. That's exactly the same as we did in the previous demo. Our SQL container is gone, but our data store container is there, and our name volumes are there as well. So that means, guess what? We can spin up another container, remap in the volumes using the dash dash volumes from. Uh, data store container, the data volume container. Confirm. Give it a couple more seconds. And that means our container will have our test database, hopefully. Boom. There we go. There it is. So there's two different methods, basically using the same concepts in the background, name volumes. But we can either create the name volumes manually, or we can use volumes from a data volume container using the dash dash volumes. From flag. Oh, one thing I should mention, actually, let's do a little cleanup here. If we come back to the top and have a look at this statement, when you say dash dash volume and specify name volume there, if that name volume doesn't exist, Docker will create it for you. So you don't need to mess around really with this statement at all. You can actually just spin, spin it up. Um, I like to create them separately because I just go, I'm little bit of a control freak. I like doing it, everything individually. Um, but if you just run Docker container run on the dash dash volume with the name volume there, it'll create it for you, no problem. OK. All righty. So we've talked about container isolation, container networking, and persisting data. Now, one thing that was really annoying me during this demo, and when I when I work with SQL in a container, because it's running as an MS SQL user, you have to change the owner of the customer locations that you want to put your databases in. So let's get around that problem by building a custom image. So let's have a look at something called a Docker file. All right, we'll do it in code here. What I'll do is that, and we'll have a look. Custom images, custom image one, Docker file. Here we go. All a Docker file is, is a file on a Docker host called Docker file that contains a bunch of commands that when we run a certain Docker command, Docker build, it will step through each one of these commands and build us a custom image. So this is a really simple one. What we've got here is we're saying from the Microsoft image, 2019 CU5. So we're going to base our new custom image off the 2019 CU5 image. We're going to switch to the root user. We're going to create a load of directories. We're then going to grant the MS SQL user access to those directories. Then we switch to the MS SQL user. 
and then we spin up SQL Server. So this new image is basically 2019 CU5 with a whole bunch of custom locations that SQL has access to. So let's go ahead and let's build that image. So if I say docker build dash T, tag my new image with a name, which I'm going to call custom image one, and then dot. And all dot is saying is look in the current location for a file called docker file. So let's build that image. So from, switch to the root user, creating a load of directories, changing the owner of those directories, switching to the MS SQL user, SQL spin up. And then we can have a look at our image there. Custom image one, great. Okie dokie. So now I can create a whole bunch of name volumes. Confirm that they're there. And run a container from scratch. Now I'm going to run from my container image. I'm going to map my name volumes to those locations in our custom image. Whole bunch of environment variables, except the end user license agreement, default data log and backup directory set to those custom locations, MS SQL password, and let's go. Okay. Make sure that container's up. Looks good. There's our locations, and look, SQL already has access to them. So I can go ahead and create a database without having to go in and manually change the owner of those locations. So by using that custom image, don't have to do any manual steps. I can now spin up a container, create a database, and it'll be on my custom locations. SQL already has access, no messing around. I'm going to make sure my database is there. And Here we go. Fantastic stuff. So just from that, we can delete that container, confirm that it's gone, and same as before, spin up another one, make sure it's running, and just give me a couple of seconds. Let's see if SQL will let me query it. Might have been too quick. There we go. There's our test database. So we've persisted our database again from one container to another just by using a custom image with default locations that are now supported by name volumes and SQL already has access to those locations. Okay, let's blow all that away. And let's head into, we've got about 10 minutes left. So let's head into the final demo. All righty, so we've talked about a load of stuff. We've done isolation, networking, persisting data, and building custom images. So let's kind of put it all together. Let's have a look at this container run statement. So we've got about 15 lines of code here. Let's see what we're going through. Docker container run dash D, run it in the background, publish some flags, and then we're setting a whole bunch of environment variables, SA password, accepting the end user license agreement, enabling the agent, setting the default data log and backup directories. Then we're spinning our container up on a custom network, mapping a load of name volumes, giving our container a name, and then specifying an image to spin our container up from. Again, the 2019 CU5 image. That's a massive statement. Do I really want to be typing that out every single time I want to run a SQL Server container? Probably not. Okay, what you could do is drop it into, a, say, a bash script and just execute the bash file, but there must be a better way of spinning up a SQL Server container with environment variable set, custom network, volumes, etc. Thankfully, there is. <laughs> There's something called Docker Compose. Now, when I first investigated Compose, I thought it was for spinning up multiple container applications, and that's true. If you want to use if you want to spin up a load of containers at once, Compose is definitely the way to go. So I didn't really look at it because I only ever really want to spin up a SQL Server container most of the time, just do some dev working and then I want to blow it away. So I didn't really look at Compose until I went to DockerCon and I was talking to a load of Docker captains there and they were saying to me, no, 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 I use Compose for everything. I don't use Docker Container Run. Even if I'm spinning up one container, I will use Docker Compose. Let's have a look why. 
in this location, I have a whole bunch of files. I have a Docker Compose YAML file, a Docker file, and a SQL Server .env file. So let's have a look at that Docker file. I won't do it here. Let's do it here. Docker file. Exactly the same as in the previous demo. We're going to build a custom image from a 2019 Steve 5 image, change the user root, create a load of custom directories, granting SQL access to those directories, switch into the MS SQL user, and then spinning up SQL Server. We also have our ENV file. And in here, now, OK, I have my SA password in a plain text in a config file. Not great, but this is a demo. There's going to be nothing in this. Don't worry about it. But don't do this. But I'm just showing you that you can put all your environment variables in this .env file so you don't have to type them out. And then finally, we have our docker compose.yaml file. We specify a version, and then we specify our services. And this is where we define our containers. So I'm going to build a container called SQL Server 1, imaginative naming as always, from a Docker file called Docker file, map some ports 15789 to 1433, specify an environment variable file, and then all of our volumes. So let's come down and let's have a look at what's on our host at the moment. We have We have no custom networks, no name volumes, and there's all of our images. OK. Now, instead of that 15 line of code monstrosity, I can just navigate to where my compose YAML file is and say docker compose up dash D. And what's going to happen here is it's going to create our network, it's going to create our volumes, and then it's going to go through our Docker file and create us our custom image. And there it is, just finishing up now. Boom. There we go. It built us our image because it did not already exist. So now let's have a look at what's running on our host. We now have our custom network, custom user defined bridge network, a load of name volumes, and we have a custom image. So just by saying Docker Compose up, it's built us all that stuff in one line of code because it can read those config files there. My container as well is up and running. There we are, 35 seconds, and I can go ahead and create a database. Where is it? Come on, there we go. SQL data, there's my files, there's my log. Those locations are supported by my name volume. Confirm my database is there. And then when I'm ready, I've finished all my work, I can say Docker Compose, just say go down, and that will stop my container, get rid of my custom network, but it will keep the image and it will keep my name volume. So when I want to spin up some work again, I can just say Docker Compose up. It will reattach all those volumes, create my network, spin up from my image, and I will have my database there ready to go. We can see network is gone, container is gone. I still have my volumes, and I still have my image. OK, so I'm going to do a little bit of a cleanup here. There we go. All righty. So we're coming up to uh, time, top of the hour. So I just want to give you some resources here. Where are we? There we go. We have my GitHub repo for this session. It's deviated from the call, Docker Deep Dive. All the, I actually do this session sometimes with slides, but it's mainly demos. There's some slides there. All the code, all the custom images, all available. You just need to pull it down more than welcome to grab all this code and play around with it as much as you'd like. There is a link to the actual slides for this session. And there's a link to that on the GitHub repo as well. Um, a link to my blog. I've got a summary of all the uh, Docker container stuff that I've ever written on that link there. If you want to go and check that out, more than welcome. Uh, last year, I wrote uh, a little book on GitHub called the SQL Server and Containers Guide. And that will take you all the way from spinning a container up uh, just by using Docker Container Run to building custom images, persisting data, using Docker Compose. More than welcome to check that out. Um, here is Liz Rice's Containers from Scratch session. Highly recommend if you, have, if you like that bit of 
uh, running containers from scratch with Go, go and check that out. She explains it far better than I do. Um, please do go and check that one out. And then finally, um, we didn't get to do this, but I have a second custom image here called Custom Image 2, where we're building a container from, uh, building a SQL container from scratch. And it's this gigantic Docker file here um, doing some crazy, crazy things that people will argue aren't best practice. So whatever, but we're building, uh, we're installing SQL from scratch here and it's using the guide that Microsoft have published about installing SQL Server on Linux. If you want to check that out, more than welcome. Um, and that's it from me. I hope you've all enjoyed. Thank you so much for attending my session. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we have one question in the chat, which is, is the compose underscore prefix mandatory for all composed based scripts? Ah, huh, that's a good question. Um, as in, where are we? Let's go back to the. As in this statement or the file itself, docker compose.yaml? Uh, I think it's the script itself. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the command. This is the docker compose command. It's actually a separate resource from docker. I'm, I can't remember if it's installed by default or not. Uh, it's been a while since I've installed it, actually, because I've got this. I've got my VM up in Azure, and I just play around in there. But it's yeah, Docker dash compose is the command to call Docker compose and have a look in the directory you're running in for your compose file to spin stuff up from here, and then in here you'll reference say if you want a Docker file or an environment variable file. Um, one thing I would mention, I think you can you can specify multiple ones of these. So what you could do is strip out say that, put it in a separate file and have it in a git ignore. So you can only have the MS SQL password locally and you can push your SQL server environment variable file up to GitHub, say you store right. it in the cloud or anywhere and then have your MS SQL password somewhere else locally. So you're not doing this incredibly bad practice that I'm doing here of storing your SA password in a config file in plain text. All right, yeah, that, that's really good. Uh, John has uh, elaborated a bit. It, it, it's about the names of the containers and the volumes. They all have a compose. Oh, um, no, I see what you mean. Yes, it, all the resources it created um, were dash compose. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure, to be fair. I, I've always been happy with the default naming. Um, might be able to change them. I haven't looked. Uh, they will They will definitely be. There's a whole bunch of um, resources on the Docker website about compose. But I've literally just I've just shoved all my stuff into my compose file here, spun it up, and let it let it let it name it what it wants. To be fair. Cool. Uh, I have one question, which I you know I don't think you'll be able to answer it in one <laughs> minute that we have left. But uh, where would you point us to if we want to enable Windows authentication uh, against SQL in a Docker container? Um, there's been a couple of blogs about that on uh, uh, the official Microsoft stuff. Uh, go and definitely check that out. Uh, they've also recently released, uh, I haven't had a chance to play with it, um, Windows authentication for SQL Server running in Kubernetes as well. If I saw that the other day. Um, All right. Yep, yeah. the, the official Microsoft stuff. I haven't had a chance to play with any of it so far. Um, but yeah, definitely go and if you want to enable AD authent, you can do it. Um, not something I've played with just. Uh, at the moment, um, but yeah, it's there. <laughs> the, the official Microsoft stuff. I'm not aware of a, anyone else blogging about it at the moment. It's something on my uh, go and play with list. Put it that yeah. way. I I do have a use case for a for a client actually. We have uh, something like 80 developer environments. They're not allowed to develop locally because they have a tendency to put production data. Uh, on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so, so it has to be hosted uh, environments, and and uh, we're looking at replacing, you know, Windows instances with uh, uh, with Docker containers instead to make them a bit more lightweight. Because uh, we have, I think, 40 instances on each, each server, so the overhead of just installing SQL Server it's it's a full time job basically. Yeah. Uh, and they will require Windows authentication to. Yeah, I think it was a big blocker for a lot of people. Uh, so I think that's why Microsoft were working on it. I remember um, Bob Ward in, um, in Munich talking about, someone asked a question, he said, it's, and I remember just going, watch this space, it's coming. And that was a couple of years ago. So no, it's, it's out there now going, I haven't played with it. I need to go and investigate it. But 
for the stuff that I do, when it's the course, it's absolutely fine. So I have any like pressing need. I just need some uh-huh. time to go play around with it. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and and for me, I think the there are so many use cases for for containers. One is to, I mean, I don't want to clutter my own computer with uh, installing SQL Server fifty five different versions and so oh, on. Oh, do you remember? Do you remember the days of having to spin up a VM to test a CTP release? Yeah, yeah. yeah those yeah. days are gone. <laughs> yeah, and, and then I think for for running tests. It's just you you put them in the pipeline, you create the container in the pipeline, you, you destroy it when the tests are done. You don't have to worry, worry about persisting volumes or anything. So it's, uh, Absolutely. Spin it up, do your work, blow it away. Thank you. And it's, it's things we just couldn't do five years ago. It would have been impossible to put that in. Well, the pipeline would have taken an hour to run. I always say it's such an exciting time to be well, working in IT in general, but for SQL Server, all these different platforms that we have, if you think about it now, we've gone from SQL Server and Windows to SQL Server in Azure, um, serverless, containers, Kubernetes, managed instances. Um, it's really, the options we have now are absolutely nuts. Yeah, and, and it's interesting to see how, how people use it. I think you have played with uh, Raspberry Pi and SQL, right? I yes I have uh, Azure SQL Edge yes <laughs> so, yes I um I'm going to be doing a talk at a Linux conference next next month on uh, running uh, not running SQL Server but just how to install Kubernetes on a Raspberry Pi build a cluster and then because I'm me I'll just demo spinning up Azure SQL Edge because yeah. why not <laughs> uh, it's pretty cool I mean the and uh, I mean for devices the size of a Matchbox. You can yeah. um, create a cluster. It's it's pretty cool. I've got my little my lab is sitting here next to me. I've got my uh, my four node cluster, my NFS server, and my switch, and then my USB hub that provides all the power is just sitting there. So when I want to spin it up, flick a switch, I've got a full blown Kubernetes cluster that I can play around with. Um, really good for learning the internals of Kubernetes. Um, if, if you want to, if you want to check out how to build. I've got a link on my blog somewhere. I'll have to post the link to it uh, later about building the building a cluster and getting Azure SQL Edge up, on, up and running on it. But I mean, I love AKS and EKS and uh, the Google one, just GKE, I think so. Um, just for uh, simplicity, I want a cluster spin up. Thank you. But if mm. you want to really know the internals and how Kubernetes works, building your own cluster, that, say, on a Raspberry Pi is absolutely invaluable. Mm. Cool. I think we're off to, at least I am, off to some. Uh, I will give you paper. control back to the screen. Um, everyone, thank you so much, Magnus. Thank you so much for hosting my session. Really enjoyed presenting. I hope everyone really enjoyed it. We did. I can I can talk for everyone. We did enjoy it. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Right. See you. Bye now, everyone. Thank you. Bye.